Hello and welcome to another episode of Throttle Stop Garage. In today's episode, we are going to go from front view to side view to three-dimensional analysis of our suspension system. Stay tuned. In the last episode, I gave my best attempt at explaining the front view geometry of a suspension, and I'm going to revise parts of that in today's episode to just further refine it, given some of the comments that I had in the last episode, as well as some further uh, reading that I've done. Uh, we're also going to go to the side view, and then we're going to go to a three-dimensional view, and we're going to try to get some of the mystique out of the whole thing. I've learned quite a bit over the past several months trying to get my head around this, and also trying to get it into a format that I think is understandable for you. A lot of this is cloaked in mysticism, and it's clearly been like that for a long time. Uh, as proof <laughs> of that, um, go and get yourself a copy of Carol Smith's Tune to Win. Because in Tune to Win, if we have a look at the chapter on suspension geometry, which is chapter four, right? The opening sentence, within a given field of study, the more variations that are possible, the more mysterious the field is liable to become. No truer words have ever been spoken uh, or written in a book about suspension geometry than that. A lot of this is mysticism. It did end up actually being easier than I thought. It didn't uh, resolve very quickly, and it does take time. But in this episode, I'm hopefully, I'm going to try to unpack that all for you and show you where we've gotten to. All right, with that, we've got to go back to the computer and have a look at a few things. I thought I would go back over some of the front view questions that I had in the last video. And I wanted to make it clear that um, a couple of things. Number one, I'm not an expert in this. I'm just trying to get some information so that I can design my own suspension. Uh, not interested in doing this ever again. Wasn't interested in doing this the first time. Uh, secondarily to that, most of the videos that I've seen online, again, forgiveness to those that have tried to do this, are covering what these things are. <laughs> so they will go into sort of lecture style explanations of, of what things might be in a suspension. I have no intention of doing most of that. I'm trying to do this practically. I'm actually designing a suspension, so I'm not trying to tell you what things are, are all the academic ways that they might vary. Really don't care. Really need to get a suspension under my car. So this is uh, me telling you what I'm doing and nothing more. All right, so let's roll along in the discussion. Again, the, the method that we're going to follow here is what's normally termed a 2 times 2D method. So we're going to have a look again at the front view, which we already did in the last video. I'm just going to correct and re-explain a few things. And then we're going to add to that the side view. And then we're going to say, hey, that's enough to get us into a three-dimensional location for some of the points and then the wheels are going to fall off. I know they are because we're going to go into a 3D space and I'm going to show you what I did there. And there's no way to make uh, 2 times 2D work in terms of actual suspension design unless the suspension's quite simple. So last time we said that the logical place to start, right, was to say we've got our tire here we've got the contact patch center, that's uh, all king, that's where everything happens. And then I'm going to need to define where the scrub radius is. So the point at which the steering axis inclination intersects the ground defines then the scrub. Now, you can't really, I can't validate why I've chosen the numbers that I've chosen, but I am going to tell you what the numbers are. The value for scrub that I selected was 20 millimeters. Based on some reading that I've done that said, hey, 20 millimeters is about in the ballpark, uh, so it's going to be inside of the center line, given the kind of vehicle that I'm working with here. And that's what I'm going to need to do. The second thing you need, so I need to start somewhere. So I've selected that point. Second to that is going to be this angle. So that's my steering axis inclination. In this case, I selected 10 and a half degrees because that gets 
ball joints, other parts, and other things away from brakes, brake rotors, and other stuff that's going to be in the way. So any two points along that line described by this angle and that point is going to be just fine. Pragmatically, though, we do have to pick some locations. So this is where I'm going to differ from what other people have told you. Uh, I went with 180 millimeters here for that lower ball joint location from the ground surface. The upper ball joint location is going to remain a variable at this point because I can tune some properties of the suspension by moving it along that line. As long as I'm on that line though at this particular location everything is fine. So that's our start position. Next I said in the last video that we were going to take uh, a position uh, that's a little different from what other people do and I said the roll center height I needed in my own head when I was working on the front view I needed to set that roll center height to a given value something that I'd located from again doing a bunch of reading look at a bunch of different cars have a look at all the differences and I said somewhere around 60 millimeters was going to be a thing and then you can take that contact patch center line and the 60 millimeters that you set for your roll center height right you can do that and that then describes another line upon which a lot of suspension geometry things have to follow fair enough no big deal there again lots of different ways to do this this is just a recap of what I did last time then I said, okay, from what I've read, almost everybody will tell you that as you start to do the definition, if you set your lower control arm pickup point, so that's the chassis member pickup point right here in orange, if you set this so that your lower control arm remains parallel to the ground plane, and flat so that in the other dimension it's not going to be inclined at all then you're going to be okay this is just what i've read you said keep it simple if you need to start changing and altering different things with the lower control arm you can but in the first instance you can set it flat so as i set that ball joint location to 180 then i know where this location is at 180 millimeters okay so we've got that set with all of those things defined we now can figure out the length of the front view swing arm. Uh, let's see. So front view swing arm is what we're after. We need the front view swing arm length. So that's going to be at the intersection of these two points. Uh, there's an instant center here, and the length of the front view swing arm is the length from the instant center all the way over to the points that are being articulated. So at any point along these lines, we are drawing a curve. If I can get my curve to draw. We're drawing a curve that's described by those points, and this is going to behave like a swing arm at that length. Okay, so front view swing arm. Now, the argument, and it wasn't really an argument, I accepted it completely because it's absolutely correct, is people said, well, you really should set your front view swing arm length first, uh, so that's that length, and then define what your roll centers are. So that's, and that's correct, actually. There's no question there for me. I just don't know what either one of those two things would be. All right, so practically, I found it easier to get off the ground, not knowing what I'm doing. And again, I've read every book, but no one's explaining this in a way that obviously I can understand. So that's my own failing, but we're going to give it the best shot that we can. Either method, you end up with an instant center going somewhere, and then you can tune from that location. Now, the length of the inst uh, uh, the length of this front view swing arm, so this length, combined with all of the links that are defining what it is, understanding that it's a complex thing, is going to give us the camber curve. So you could even go from the camber curve back to the length that you needed and then get that back to find this position. Any old method would work because all of this is in a great big circle. Okay, so this is fine. I'm just telling you how I did it. Okay, so now that we've got that done, what I said last time is any old change in that roll center height. So if we move that roll center height, say down 20 millimeters, 
you can see what happens with that front view swing arm length. So it gets very much greater, which of course would change the radius of what it is you were trying to do over here. So that's going to change your camber gain. So at this point, maybe it gets a whole lot straighter. So we have less camber gain. The longer we make this, the less camber gain we'll have. Great. Let's go back to that original location just to finish the conversation. We're going to throw the other uh, side of the suspension in. So we're not just working on one side, but we can show you where these things end up in on two sides. Here's what I found. I set it up in essence to be the track of that front suspension. So I set the point so it would fall on the line about there. Uh, good enough. As I was tuning, I found that, you know, certain suspension properties got a little better if I moved, uh, moved it in or I moved it out. But as a starting point, not a bad place to start would be around the track somewhere. It'll get you in the ballpark and let you work from there. Okay, other things that can have dramatic effects, and we're going to need to know all of these things. Again, some of this stuff's kind of unwritten, or maybe the geniuses know it, but I certainly didn't. If I set that lower control arm, like once again, to be parallel to the ground surface, so that's this one here, I also have the option, if I need, that I can tune where this front view swing arm is in space vertically, right? So this distance here. So we can move that around pretty effectively by simply moving that ball joint either up or down. Very small amounts, just given the length of the line that we're talking about here. Small amounts over here uh, end up being really rather large amounts when we look at them over in this location. And the net effect that this has for any given swing arm length by the way. So if we have the same swing arm length, I'll try to draw this, it may or may not work. So imagine we have a swing arm length and we have a camber curve attached to that swing arm. And we're moving it up and down. We're not changing the curve that the wheel is traveling through. We're changing where along the arc. Notice the difference between here. Here we're almost touching, here we're further apart. So as you're, as you're doing some of this modeling, if you find that along your camber curve at certain points, if it's going say straight up and then it, it tucks in hard or the other way around, it initially goes up pretty straight and then curves in quite sharply. And you'd like to alter the location of that curve to make it a bit more say symmetrical, then that involves relocating the vertical distance of that of that instant center location so it's not changing the front view swing arm length so maybe we're happy with the rate of change generally but we're just not happy with where that curve ends up intersecting on our suspension uh right so i found all of these were really essential to have you know locked away in my head in order to start tuning this or it became really rather hopeless Anyways, from that instant center location here for whatever uh, front view swing arm you have, you simply draw your line back up through to your upper ball joint point. Then you can control the, the length of that arm, whatever it needs to be. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, because this is what controls the dynamics of that curve that I just drew for your camber, is the length and angle of that arm. Uh, then you're pretty much done for your front suspension view so this is your front view layout pretty much finished. Then your camber gain overall is going to be a function of the following things. Length of the front view swing arm, the length of the arms themselves, and their angular relationship. So the side view geometry, I thought, okay, this is going to be the second half of this 2 times 2D uh, piece. So that's going to be fine. I've got the ball joint locations here in the tire. I can then turn that tire through 90 degrees so I can look at it in side view. I then say, okay, that's where the center of the contact patch is. Then just like last time, I need to start with another variable. That variable is mechanical trail. So this little distance in here says it's very much like scrub in the other dimension. This was our scrub here, right? So that I said was 20 millimeters in the front view. I set this to 15 millimeters uh, in the side view. Once again, 
that's what folks said were was going to work. And at a first instance, I just need somewhere to start. I don't want a whole ton of mechanical trail because I know I also have pneumatic trail from the tire. Uh, and I'm unsure about any of this stuff because I'm just a guy in my garage trying to get a suspension under a car, right? Uh, so I don't have a tire model. I don't have, in essence, I don't have any of the stuff that most people don't have uh, to do this sort of work. And yet somehow... Um, in my in my opinion, I think we can get it to work. You then set your caster angle, and the caster angle is going to be in conjunction with the the steering axis inclination and the caster angle, as well as what you want for dynamics. You've got to do your own homework here. You've got to do your own reading here. I said somewhere in between five and six degrees for caster is going to be my design target. So from that mechanical trail, I had to set an angle. So I set that angle here and I set it to my target from the mechanical trail. And then I figured, okay, the rest of this should be pretty straightforward. I've already said that, you know, the ball joints, you can just translocate over, right? They are going to set that caster angle. That's going to be fine. And then from there, I said that lower control arm position is going to be flat right, and 180 millimeters off the ground. Uh, then the other position that I'm going to set is that upper control arm in. Now, one of the things that you can do with upper control arms and suspension geometry in general in side view is you can add in some other features. So you can start putting in what are called anti-features. So you can put in, in this case, I'm gonna be looking at adding some anti-dive into this suspension. <laughs> We have to start to consider what happens in the event of braking. So just like what we did in the front view when we looked at roll, we are going to do sort of the same sort of thing. It's a little bit less complicated, but a little bit more complicated to talk about uh, the pitch behavior uh, of a vehicle. So we're going to actually get in a little bit to the pitch behavior. Now, if you need more detailed uh, sort of lecture style material on this. This isn't your video. We're just going to, we're, I'm just trying to take you through the process. I'm not trying to say, uh, here are all the calculations. I, I just think that would get boring and tedious for both of us. So let's just make sure we understand what all of this stuff means, because to be perfectly frank, uh, I have struggled with the side view swing arm. First, what we're going to be doing here is, is we're reacting the braking force. So the braking force is in essence caused by the tire, uh, so you've got a brake being applied somewhere inside the wheel. The wheel then, again, acts on the ground. So that's where that moment is created about that. And then we have to go up to the center of gravity. So I've relocated my center of gravity over here, and I've placed it about where it would be for the vehicle that I'm designing. So I'm designing a sedan. Um, it's not a race car. It's it's not a sports car. It's got sporting intent, right? Let's be serious. But uh, it's not it's not that kind of thing. So the center of gravity is going to be a little bit higher. And I am taking a best guess at this. The vehicle is obviously not complete. So, you know, whatever I do here, I'm going to need tuning elements so that I can tune my way out of whatever trouble I'm about to create for myself. But what happens is the following. If I do nothing with the geometry here of the front end, so if I leave these pivots in their original orientation as per the front view layout, and I just say there's going to be no angular relationship be between the upper and the lower control arm pivot points, and these are the pivots. These are not the ball joints, right? So the ball joint locations are fixed. We've got our mechanical trail set. We're all fine. Then... What happens here is we start to transfer this load uh, from the center of gravity that's going to be going forward in reaction to uh, the braking force that was applied here on the ground surface. If I have no angular relationship between the upper control arms and the lower control arms, as I just mentioned, then everything that happens, the only thing that can happen here actually, is that you would get compression of the front spring. So whatever you've got in terms of springs and bars, so we've got a spring here somewhere in that front suspension and the load that gets transferred to the front, right, has to be counteracted by the spring or else the vehicle would bottom out. If you put a spring in there uh, to hold it up anyway, which you have to do, again, that's the nature of the way that suspensions work. Um, 
then you have to have sufficient spring there to counteract whatever load transfer you're you're going to do. Now we're not going to get into the load transfer, but you need to know, you know, you need to know the wheelbase, right? You need to know the brake percent, right? It, it, there's a lot of stuff in here that if you're going to do this kind of design work, you do need all of the variables and you do need to tease it apart. I'm, I'm again, I'm not covering that today. I'm just trying to get the basics down. So if you have nothing going on here, because uh, the side view swing arm, it, it's in essence is infinite, right? So it's, it's going over here. It's the only thing you have then is you place it, you, you, you place the instant center for these things on the ground. Uh, so in other words, you have a pretty good lever over top of the center of gravity. And uh, this is going to go uh, up and down pretty easily in reaction to whatever that load transfer might be. Okay, so we can accept that. So this is just a little green arrow saying I have to have a force equal to this going up or else the suspension will compress. Uh, so this is one of the things that people tend to do is they tend to, to say, well, if I don't want my car to be really pitchy, I'm going to add more spring, right? So add more spring. But the effect of this sometimes is it reduces ride quality. Now, if you're in a race car, it can also do things like can actually decrease grip. So it can decrease mechanical grip. So there are sort of reasons that you, you want to have a suspension that can react this um, from more than just the spring, right? It would be nice to not have to have, you know, a, a fair amount of spring up the front uh, because it can make for an uncomfortable ride and you can actually lose mechanical grip and that would be bad. Okay, well, it wouldn't be bad, but let's not do it. The easiest way to do this is if I simply rearrange where the instant center is located. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to move the rear pivot, uh, the rear pivot for that upper control arm, I'm just going to rotate it down. I'm going to leave the pivot, in essence, in the same place. This is where everything kind of gets complicated. Uh, so if I zoom out a little bit so that you can now see that I've created another instant center over here, but this is going to be in side view. Once again, we're going to draw a line and it connects the contact patch of the wheel, so where the force is being generated up to that instant center. Right, and then as simple as we can explain it is by saying, well, as soon as we do this, as soon as we create this instant center, then the forces that we've created from the tire have somewhere to go. Okay, so they're no longer just, you know, heading straight, uh, you know, parallel to the ground surface. Um, but they do have an angle that goes up towards the instant center. It's the same concept as a roll center. And what this gives us is a jacking force. So a jacking force is created here, right? So that's... It's just because of the angularity of the arms. And what I've seen explained in most of the other videos that I've watched in the, is that, you know, we can, we can move these things around by, you know, computing the following sorts of things. Now, the computation here is very simple, and I understand that it's incorrect, so don't be yelling at me for that in the comments. But do comment in the comments if you know an easier explanation than this. Um, so wherever that force line, right, crosses the center line of the vehicle as described by the center of gravity just projected down to the bottom. Then you can draw a line in there and you can say this is the amount of that jacking force versus the moment that you have created here. And most uh, videos will tell you that this is a, the equivalent of the anti-dive percent. Now, this is dramatically oversimplified because you do need to know the braking percentages you do need to know the wheelbase you do like there's a lot of other stuff going on here i understand that but in this instance maybe i'm 20 percent yeah 20 percent anti-dive something like that 50 percent would be here 100 percent would be here so if i had 100 percent anti-dive all it means is as the force is being applied uh, by the tire to the ground uh, you wouldn't get any dive, but you'd have enough force coming up. Uh, so this, in other words, the lever would be so small, you wouldn't be able to, uh, you'd have no leverage over the center of gravity, right? Um, if you'd like to get more into load transfer and vehicle dynamics, there's lots of great videos out there. Uh, please go and watch a few. Okay, so for this car, I figure because it's a sedan in nature, because the center of gravity is sort of high, ish, I think. I'm not too sure, but it's not going to be as low as it would be in a Miata or something. Um, now, lots of people say, don't do this. They say, don't 
you know, they'd say, don't do this. They say, no anti-dive. Don't put elements in your suspension that will cause your suspension to bind. That's what I've read. Um, most of those folks are talking about sports cars, though, where the center of gravity is quite a bit lower. So you, you can fairly easily react the load transfer via the spring and not have a whole lot of negative consequences. What I have noticed if I go forward and show you a few images I stole from the internet. Uh, so this is a brand new Ford Bronco. And I see this on a lot of um, pickup trucks and other things that would have, I mean, higher centers of gravity than I'm dealing with. Um, but you can see that that upper control arm has got a significant, even though, I mean, the photos aren't perfect. I didn't take them or anything, but, you know, we're talking about a pretty significant angle versus um, uh, something that would be parallel to that lower control arm on this vehicle. So the suspension designers have decided to add in uh, some anti-dive here uh, so that they don't have to use as big a spring here. Uh, and they can make the drive a little nicer and still not have something uh, that when you hit the brakes hard uh, causes the vehicle to pitch forward dramatically. Again, you do, most drivers are a lot more comfortable with a vehicle that pitches forward uh, a little bit as they're, as they're braking. Uh, if the vehicle doesn't pitch at all, I've never driven a vehicle like this, but I'm told it's a little bit weird and you can have some other sketchy effects that kind of kick in there. So uh, that load transfer, you know, it's going to always be there. How you deal with it is up to you. Okay, so this is the way that we deal with it in trucks. And then if we go to sports cars, again, another picture that I borrowed. I think this is an NC Miata. And lots of people have suggested that I should use like Miata suspension. And you can see that that lower control arm is going to be parallel and that upper control arm has just a hint, right? So if this is straight here, this top frame section, then you can see that where that upper control mar uh, mounts in the front versus where it mounts in the rear is just a little different. Like it would be, that would be the difference in the top of that upper control arm. So just a little bit. So they're using a little but a lot less anti-dive. And they're using a lot less anti-dive because again, the center of gravity, if we drew that vehicle, the center of gravity is here, right? So it's not up here. Uh, the higher it is, I think the more anti-dive you normally would use. Anyway, these are just my theories They're not based on much. Um, for this car, I went with 20%. Uh, why? It's a nice number. I'm also gonna design the ability to move this pivot and this pivot as needed to alter it should it be uh, an un should it yield an undesirable characteristic understanding that i'm not exactly sure how all of this is going to work perfectly uh or if, if perfection's even desirable the last piece of the puzzle before moving to 3d is to do the steering now I have to do this in a dramatically simplified version. Um, just stay with me for a second and I'll see if I can explain it. Uh, so you're getting the idea that this is a lot of stuff. Well, I, hope, I hope that's at least, if you get nothing else out of this video, I hope that's there. Okay, so back to the front view. Okay, so we're going to go to the front view of the suspension. If we have a look at the upper control arm pivot, the lower control arm pivot, uh, and we understand that the arc through which those things are translated. These are the fixed points, right? These don't move. So those are the fixed points. Uh, and because they're fixed, uh, the wheel is rotating uh, about the fixed points via the links uh, and the way the links describe things like an instant center. Okay, so we're happy enough with that. If we place our steering rack so that the pivots of the steering rack so the inner pivots sit on this line, right? This line. If we place the pivots here, we're going to be okay, right? Now, my design objective first, I have a steering rack that's 610 millimeters from pivot to pivot. So that was important. I also want to get that as low as I can. This is a significant design consideration for me because I have an engine that sits in here. The prior suspension that I had had a, a, a pivot that was sitting up here 
and that meant my engine had to be uh, higher than I would like, and I've always wanted to get that down low. So as the redesign had to happen, was one of my first criteria was to find a steering rack with a small a pivot to pivot and powered and, and all the rest of the stuff that I wanted. And I have sourced one of those racks. Uh, it's from a BMW. Uh, this is from a Z3 Roadster, the M variant. Right, so it's like 2.8 turns lock to lock, and it's 610 millimeters from pivot to pivot. Okay, so that's going to get located down here. Then the outer tie rod end, you go back to the instant center, you draw a line through the pivot, and then it locates itself out on this other line, which is the steering axis inclination uh, angle. And you plunk it down in there or thereabouts, and Initially, what you're trying to avoid here is bump steer. Okay, so for all the other things that we've talked about, this is the most significant. I put it in bright shining lights or something. Uh, if you have a vehicle with bump steer, I don't care what your camber characteristics are or any of the other stuff, it is going to be horrific. And if you've never driven a car with bump steer, um, find a friend with... <laughs> That's monkeyed around with their suspension. Uh, drive it. It's garbage. It's horrible. You go over a bump. The car's jerking in directions. You're driving down the highway. It's self-steering. It's weird. Uh, I've had this experience, so that's not simply my opinion that bump steer is the most important uh, characteristic for a suspension. I think most people that do this uh, would agree with me there. So if all else fails, uh, create a suspension that doesn't have bump steer or has the bump steer has been you know, as small as humanly possible to make it. Uh, okay, so we're going to relocate, you know, back to this, um, the front view, and I have to get all the coordinates. I need the X, Y, and Z coordinates of those two points. So I've just placed the first one. So this is that outer arm. So this is this pivot here is this one here. Right, so I've placed it. Then you can do things like this is steering ratios, right? So how far out it is is, you know, how much for every bit of suspension or steering travel, how quickly you turn the wheel, that kind of stuff. You have to do those calculations too. Uh, then I also need to know where that inner pivot lies, right? Because they're not in the same plane. The inner pivot here is lower. I can then also move this inner pivot around. So I can move it uh, where I like, and that is going to control, in this instance, it's going to be one of the variables that controls Ackerman. Uh, so this Ackerman characteristic, oh, it's, it's simple enough. Uh, there's some great videos that describe Ackerman. If you have a cart, that's the example I like the best, uh, and you're turning the wheels of a cart, right? We recognize that if we start going around a corner of any radius, right of any radius with said cart that the inner wheel is describing a different length of arc than the outer wheel uh, so we should add Ackerman in in order to account for these two differences it's simple see there that's Ackerman right there now what you'll read about Ackerman is enough to start a fight amongst friendly people um, so Ackerman is is complicated again another complicated thing because tires are squishy and speeds and other things. I mean, if you watch Formula One racing, you will find that they run anti-Ackerman on a lot of cars. So the outer wheel is actually turning more than the inner. And this has to do with load and tire dynamics and scrub and other things like you, you can use it to generate heat. You, all kinds of stuff are controlled here. Um, I'm going to add a little bit. I think I was, I was specking something, you know, between sort of 20 and 50%. Um, now, the only thing that I've been told about this truly, like when talking to people who do this, uh, vehicles without Ackerman are harder to push. <laughs> so uh, so I thought, well, if I ever break down, I'm probably going to want a little bit of Ackerman steering in there just so I can make the thing work. Um, but I'm not going to get all that excited about it. And at this point, if you're still with me, let's go and talk about 3D because it gets worse, folks. It gets worse. I've been at this for months, right? So we're going to go and talk about 3D now.
as I jumped into doing the 3D modeling, I did have to take the dog for a walk in the forest just for a while. I needed to clear my head before I started in on this next adventure. Right. Okay, so we're now out in the garage. Uh, this is actually where I do most of the modeling. I can uh, put the radio on and I got the car and I don't have all the other distractions of in the house. Uh, this is an ancient tough book. It's the only computer that I still have that'll run the software that I'm going to be using for this. And you can see I've laid it out first just in a simple Google Sheet. I've got all the points and I can move these points between um, the various things that I have to do at this point. So I have to have a CAD version running if I'm going to be moving stuff because I have to keep it updated. But most importantly, I need to be moving uh, to Shark. So we're going to be using Lotus Shark for this. This is, again, older software on older computers, but you know what? It works, and I have a copy. Um, the first thing you need to be able to do is get some kind of correlation between what you were doing in your 2D model and what you're now doing in your 3D model, and that's not easy. So I did find this to be quite difficult. Shark's a full 3D analysis software. So a lot of the things that are being computed, including things like the roll center, which is right here, and other elements are calculated a little differently. And it does matter. Don't freak out about it. Um, you do need to get both the front and the rear suspension in here for this to be correct. You need to get steering. And you have to have all of this geometry in front view correct then you go to the side view version of this and you have a look at that and make sure it's what you want in terms of the dimensions various other things steering and others uh, then you can go to the top view and you can do things like set those rack parameters that will do things like calculate Ackerman okay so over here on the side are the outputs this is not the finished model, by the way. I worked on this for months to get this right. Uh, and it was, you know, like months of weekends and sometimes weeks at a time where I'd be working on it. Not full time, but I've spent a lot of time with this model and I still have no idea if it's right. I even have reached out to suspension engineers working for big companies that say they do these sorts of things. And I've just said, I'll send you whatever data I have could you just give me a sanity check? I'll pay you whatever you want to receive exactly zero feedback from them, not even an acknowledgement of an email. So to say that I feel a little bit alone on the project right now is, uh, is, is uh, sort of an understatement, but I do have some good friends in the background who are uh, helping me through some of these uh, the rather deep depths. So um, anyway, so if we go back to the front view we can then do uh, things within shark that this is what's driving all of the graphs so the graphs have motion you have to set all this up so you can control how much i mean again 70 millimeters is kind of a lot but i live in the land of the frozen north so potholes and other things as well as you know you'd like to be able to account for a certain amount of suspension movement we're not driving a go-kart here um so i've got those things done and then it by default will bring up all kinds of things that you want. So this is a, a camber curve here, right? So we can, we can have even a bigger look at it if you like. So this is a camber angle change with bump or in rebound. Uh, so this is how much degree and you can calculate your rates uh, and you can see whether or not you're in that ballpark that you wanted to be at. I uh, found that to be very handy. Uh, you can also look at how much um, toe change you have with things like movement uh so this isn't very good okay so we've got a little bit of a problem here in bump steer and then there's other things that we're going to look at uh so we can look at what happens with respect to track change as well uh we haven't talked about that yet but you do have to start considering that so uh, again i don't I have, i'm not going to do a million more powerpoints i've done enough powerpoints but the wheels are going to actually move in right uh and they'll change the track of the vehicle that can also cause instabilities and other problems as you're as you're doing these sorts of things from here you can ask it to animate right you can throw it into an animation routine and you can see what it's doing so here i can see that it's towing right so i can watch that tire move and i can see that the tire is moving in and then i can start playing with the suspension parameters to try to take those unwanted behaviors out of it i can also observe these things in different 
different dimensions. I can look at them from the top and I can see, okay, well, I've got the camber is clear. You can see that it's coming up, but I can also see that that tire is wiggling around a lot. And that certainly can't be the kind of behavior that I would like. So from here, let's just take this as the start point. So I, and this is dated August 18th. It's now November. Uh, and now I've been done for a while. I've been just really, really super busy at work. So I've not been able to get uh, to the project for about uh, two months, actually. Like to be fully honest, that and I've blown out both my knees this past summer. So I'm uh, a little disabled at the moment, but um, I'm getting better. <laughs> so it's okay. okay. So now we're moving the suspension up and down. And we're holding the ground plane uh, stable. So that's just switching from this mode to this mode. Now, personally, when I started doing this, then certain elements started to make more sense because I it's, it's sort of like touching or feeling a thing, right? So uh, the ground doesn't normally move. The suspension's moving in relation to the ground. Anyways, for my brain, this worked better. Uh, it also will show me areas where if I break the model or other bad things happen, it will it will tell me that... You know, you've broken the model in this view, right? Okay, so we're going to go to a more recent version, the version that we're going to design around, and we'll have a look at that now. So this is sort of the start point. All I was working on here was trying to get the correlation right, like trying to get the rate of change of camber correct, and then seeing all the other things that I'd created. So did that, wasn't super happy with it, and then I had to keep coming back to change the things that I needed to change to make this better. Here's the final version for September 1st. So again, this is November and late November at that. Just have a look in the bottom corner and you'll see when I'm doing this. Um, but now you can see what's been fixed up here. So if we have a look at that toe angle change, uh, you can now see the sort of uh, toe angle that we're getting. So over a normal range of suspension articulation, we're having no change at all. You can see the value here is in the very, very small digits, like almost immeasurable. This is 30, like what, 0 0.03 of a millimeter uh, out to here. It's still less. It's like a tenth of a millimeter here. So this is nothing. I'm not worried about that a little bit of bump steer. There's you know, I can probably still dial or tune that out, but I don't even know if I can measure. I could probably measure it in the garage. I mean, heck, I'd figure out how to do it, but uh, that's not a concern anymore. I've calmed down the uh, the camber curve just a little bit uh, so that it wasn't quite so aggressive. I was looking for about half a degree of camber per uh, inch if you like if you're in the US of uh, suspension travel so and that has to do with a combination of body roll and other things that I just think this is going to work uh, so that's fine so we're just you're trying to dial in every one of these parameters the hard part is whenever you're changing stuff in this three-dimensional model you're changing everything all the time uh, and this is that uh, change in terms of track uh, so track width change again, we're down into, you know, in, in rebound at uh, fairly long degrees here. So at 70 mil, or not 70, but this is at 50 mil uh, worth of rebound. I've got, what do I have? Five millimeters. So I have quarter of an inch right, uh, thereabouts. Um, worth of um worth the track change which is again this is this is no big deal especially considering you're you know you're in these smaller ends all the time and it's it's less uh, horrific and bump so uh and you're always going to have some it's just controlling how you have it and where it is and that's the important part um so when i start moving that one around yeah, I think actually this one here helps me out more. Um, so you can see here the up and down, the camber is, the camber curve is quite a bit more calmed down from that. You know, we're not getting any bump steer uh, within that. And then we can, again, you can do everything you want in here. You can dynamically move things. You can change them around. You can do all kinds of things. But you can see we, we don't have a whole lot of even wheelbase change here, which is nice. And you can call up every single parameter <laughs> available uh, to anyone who's ever done suspension stuff ever uh, so that's a lot of stuff and when you have a lot of stuff like that it gets quite confusing um, the last thing is is the Ackerman element right so uh, as soon as we go in we can then steer it uh, in terms of Ackerman percent here 20 what do we got here uh, 34 percent so it's fine. I'm not worried. Um, I just danced around it. I wanted to make sure a couple of simple things like it was symmetrical side to side and other things weren't going to get weird on me. Um, 
So within each one of these things, when you change what you're doing, if you're steering it, if you're rolling it, or if you're bumping it, then it's changing all of your outputs all of the time. Like it's just changing it to reflect what those parameters are. I also looked at roll centers and other things along the way. Uh, so this is like roll center migration and I want to make sure that wasn't doing anything silly or stupid and it doesn't, uh, at least not in my opinion. Okay, so the 3D modeling part, it's the same as doing the 2D model, which as I've done this more, I think if I had a pretty good, if I had a better idea, like five months ago where I was starting, I think I would have got there a little bit more quickly, but doing the 2D thing wasn't hopeless. Uh, it was good experience for me just to look at and make sure I knew um, what I was doing. I was learning, right? Which is, you're going to have to do that. I, I did a ton of reading. I still, again, not too sure I'm right, but it doesn't look crazy to me. If there was one thing I learned during the process was that setting the setting one parameter, then starts controlling what all the other parameters are and parametric modeling, you know, I should know better, but that's that's the truth. That's where we're at at this point. Uh, let's stop it dancing. No magic at this time, but all I can say is what we have now is a whole set of points. So this still isn't parts. Uh, what I have sitting around me are the parts. Now, I've so I've obviously been playing. So that's what I've got for parts <laughs> at this point. Uh, so I've gone ahead and designed some of the parts, but I'm not, I mean, again, I haven't had time, so I've not got anything finished in terms of design, but I've, I've moved a ways along, right? So, you know, I've got a hub uh, carrier here. I mean, this one's rusty, so it's not going to fit in here very well. So that'll mount to the hub, right? So those, I've got two sets of everything because if I make a mistake, um, I'm going to need to do something about that. Uh, I also have designed various uh, heat sinks and other elements for this so that I can, you know, when welding, try to keep distortions down to as small as I can. Um, so those heat sinks are done. Um, I have ways of locating ball joints so these are going to hold the ball joint cups so that i can position the ball joint cups properly had to machine those these are heat sinks that'll be used for these these are the bushing holders uh, that we'll be using and then tube is going to go on the bushing holders uh, i still haven't worked out adjusters and things yet so we're now exiting the part of the project that's just points in space and just pure kinematics and we have to enter into actual engineering where we go in and say, all right, well, what are we gonna make? What are we gonna make parts out of? So this is all mild steel. These, these again, these are all based on the fact that I had um, the C4 parts, uh, the C4 Corvette parts for the suspension made, right? So I have Delrin, urethane, and stainless steel is the foundation for this three-part bushing that I've wanted to try. It's more of an idea than anything. Um, and that's the, I, I just thinned out the wall so that I wasn't carrying a bunch of, it's not like I didn't want to reduce weight on the thing per se, it doesn't matter. Um, I just didn't want it big and fat and heavy for no good reason. Uh, and some of them are smaller and some of them are bigger um, because that was the way the Corvette was and I have all those parts. So I just want to use those. I've already spent that money, right? We're already well into this. Okay, so with that, that's Suspension 101 done, I think. I don't know. But I can tell you, I'm not doing any more work on it. That's all I know. And with that, um, roll of credits. All right, so that's a wrap for this episode. We've seen lots of different things. I've got parts of the suspension now designed and in the computer. I'm nowhere near finished. Uh, to be honest, it takes me quite a bit of time to do the CAD work. Uh, if you're a CAD guru, that's great for you. I'm not that, so I'm doing the best I can. If you've got comments about today's episode, I'll tell you what, I'm not finished doing this yet. So down in the comments, please, uh, that's what that's for. I guess for other channels, it might be about driving the algorithm, uh, but for me, it's about driving the conversation so if you've got other knowledge about suspension design and you want to make a comment below and try to help me out i am 100 percent listening i'm all ears nothing has been committed so far um and we're going to go about some of those things in the next episode i don't see a whole lot of point in going further in most of the design work because i don't have a tire model i don't have all of the other stuff that i would actually need to do this and i'm pretty sure i can get there just with tuning now i might be completely wrong if i'm completely wrong again down in the comments like to know 
And if you're still with us all the way at the end, thanks very much for watching. Um, we'll catch you on the next episode, and don't forget, keep your stick on the ice.